Uh, hello everybody, I represent here Master Training Office and we um, do welcome you to the lecture of uh, Professor Remkin. I hope you will enjoy it. So I give you all the details. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me? If anything is unclear during my presentation, feel free to raise your hand and ask a question. After the presentation, I hope we can have time for questions and answers. It's a real honor for me to be at MGIBO to be able to meet with you and talk to you about a project I've been doing research on for many years. It's a project which tries to explain why inequality, economic inequality, is so high in so many countries. And the countries that I have been concentrating on are the United States, where I'm from, Russia, and China. So let me show you what I am thinking about. I don't know if you can see in the lower right corner a note from the television broadcast from President Putin's primaria linea, the direct line, that he held this past June. As you know, during the primaria linea, which can go on for several hours, President Putin takes questions from around the country from people everywhere. And one of the questions that were addressed to him was this very simple one, oligarchia na sigda, Znak, a question mark, will there be oligarchy forever? And President Putin did not answer that question. He had, you know, millions of questions and he did not choose to answer that question. But I would like to answer it, <laughs> or at least use it as the motivation for this talk. So the question that I'm asking is, why is inequality economic inequality so similar in Russia, China, and the United States. Now, perhaps in your economics courses, you are studying some of the economic forces that lead to rising inequality. They include the global integration of production and finance that we often refer to as globalization. We certainly have the rising gaps in the ability of people to use their education to benefit from technological change. This is a theory that economics calls skill-biased technological change. But <clears throat> I am a political scientist and I'm interested in knowing what political factors might account for rising economic inequality. And when we have uh, political explanations for inequality in the literature, we often think about specific country level explanations. We might say a particular country has certain legacies in its history. We might look at the transition from the socialist planned economy that uh, occurred in the former Soviet Union. Um, but what I'm wondering is whether there's a more general explanation for rising economic inequality. So in answering this question, I look at the United States, Russia, and China as very different systems using a method which in comparative politics we call the most different systems method. That is, we have very different political systems but a similarity in the outcome. And we are interested in what variable might explain the similarity in the outcome. So I will review for you some similarities between among these three countries. You are very familiar with the fact that all three are quite large, all three are quite heterogeneous. And in this geographic heterogeneity, we have a great deal of asymmetry in the distribution of natural resources, industrial resources, human resources. So their economic geographies are different. All three, and I think this is important for us, have quite weak collective labor power. All three, of course, have trade unions. But in all three countries, the collective power of trade unions is quite weak. And all three countries have 
surprising similarities in the phases of liberalization or deregulation beginning in China at the end of the 1970s, in the United States also at the end of the 1970s, and in Russia at the end of the 1980s and the beginning of the, at the, beginning of the 1990s. And yet, of course, we have deep differences in their political and economic systems. China retains a communist party and a communist system of rule in politics, even though it has undertaken significant market reforms in its economy. Russia no longer has communist rule, and it has also undertaken significant market reforms. The United States has party competition <clears throat> and a more open political system, but it has also a more market-driven economy than either Russia or China. However, it is interesting that historically all three countries underwent these phases of economic liberalization, the opening up of the economies, the deregulation of their economies, beginning roughly at the same time. So I have been wondering, do these phases of liberalization help us explain the outcomes that we see with respect to inequality? So historically, you are probably familiar from your courses with some of the background to these phases. In the United States, we saw the end of what's called the Bretton Woods system. That is, we had uh, regulated currency exchange. We now have floating currencies. And that has stimulated an enormous flow of financial capital uh, into and out of the United States and other countries. The United States also undertook major deregulation. Industries that had been regulated by the government to restrict competition were allowed to compete. That concerned banking and airlines and trucking and many other industries. Moreover, beginning in the late 1970s uh, and then certainly under President Reagan in the 1980s, there was a strong attack on the power of organized labor because, as you know, the Republicans in the United States tend to be very hostile to the power of labor. And what happened in the US was there was a burst of competition in these industries that had been deregulated, uh, telecommunications, for example, and uh, banking. And then we saw, and we continue to see, very significant concentration in those industries so that more and more production or value added in banking and in telecommunications, in pharmaceuticals and in many other industries, we are seeing a smaller number of very large firms dominate the industries. We also have in the United States what we call the financialization of the economy. More and more of the profits in the economy are coming through the financial system. Uh, it's an enormous role that our financial industry plays in our economy in the United States. Now, what about Russia? Well, we also had, beginning to some degree with Perestroika in the late 1980s and very strongly beginning in the early 1990s, we saw the liberalization sometimes associated with shock therapy uh, <clears throat> beginning in 1992. So I don't need to remind you of some of the consequences of the lifting of state controls and the dismantling of state planning that occurred in Russia. In China, we have a similar phase of what the Chinese called Gu uh, Kaifeng. This is the reform and opening up of the economy under beginning with Deng Xiaoping. And then we have officially in China the turn to what they call market socialism. And that continues to be the phrase in China. Uh, President, uh, Party uh, Secretary Xi Jinping says they are continuing to believe in market socialism. They want market forces to drive the economy, even though the Communist Party controls the political system. In all three countries, we saw some similar results. Those industries that were most well positioned to capture economic rents profited very strongly in the early phases of deregulation. Now I want to call your attention 
to the concept of rents. Rents are the returns to a factor of production above what is needed to keep that factor of production in the market. A simpler way of understanding it is rents are the profits that come to a factor of production like capital when it is kept from competition. The simplest way of understanding it is rents are the surplus profits that you get from having a monopoly. So we talk about monopoly rents. It's not a difficult concept to understand. The reason it is so important for these countries is if you have a monopoly or a dominant position in your industry, your political interest is in maintaining that monopoly. And we call that behavior rent seeking. The effort to preserve, to protect that stream of rents that you get from holding a monopoly or an oligopoly, a dominant position in the market. <clears throat> so in all three countries, we saw the companies that enjoyed a, a growing dominance in their markets form alliances with policymakers. In the context of China, this is often called crony capitalism. In the context of post-Soviet Russia, this is often called the exchange of benefits of elites, economic elites and political elites. Um, in the former Soviet realm, we also speak of the early winners, that the uh, people that benefited early on in Russia and in Ukraine and in uh, most of the other former Soviet republics, they captured a large share of the market and did not allow other competitors to enter the market. And through forming exchanges of mutual benefit with policymakers, these economic elites created positive feedback loops between their income and their political influence, their income and their wealth. I believe that when we look at inequality in Russia or in Ukraine or in China, we cannot say that inequality is primarily due to the effect of the transition from a state-planned socialist economy to a market economy. Many economists said, yes, we will see an early burst of inequality because you will remember that in those planned economies, wages were controlled by the state. So in the early phase of the liberalization, wages of some people went way up. Wages of other people stagnated, and still other people lost their jobs. So yes, the dynamics of transition account for some of the inequality that set in, but not, I believe, the continuing inequality that we still see in Russia and China. <clears throat> Likewise, in the United States, sometimes people say, well, in the United States, there's high inequality because in the US, we have so many uh, points of uh, uh, veto power over policy making. We have the Congress, the President, the courts, the states. Uh, it is very difficult to uh, overcome the resistance to changes in policy, and this tends to lock in inequality. I don't think that's a very powerful theory <clears throat> because we see very similar process, processes in the US that we see in Russia and in China. It's, as I say, this is puzzling. Now some of you, could I ask you, how many of you know the work of Thomas Piketty, Piketty, the French economist? Well, he's very famous as we know and justifiably so, and he has a theory about inequality uh, and why it's high in our time, the late 20th century, early 21st century, which has to do with the accumulation of wealth. Uh, 
in the society. His theory is famously summarized as R is greater than G. R is the rate of return or profit on capital, which he says can run higher than the rate of growth of an economy over a long period of time, and that enables capital to be accumulated, and those who own capital accumulate wealth, they pass it on to their heirs, and over time, the share of wealth in the economy grows, and the share of income due to wealth grows. It's a very powerful, very simple theory, but it does not apply to our three countries. Because most of the economic inequality we are seeing in Russia, China, and the US is coming from inequality in the distribution of labor income, not wealth income. But we do see in these three countries similarity in the consolidation of economic and political power that especially occurs in those industries that are best positioned to capture rents from monopolies. In Russia, obviously, natural resources, oil and gas and other natural resources, enable some industries to monopolize their branches and collect rents. In all three countries, the finance, insurance, and real estate industries, which sometimes we call fire, it's banking, but it's also insurance and so on, these sectors have become immensely profitable and the people working in them uh, quite wealthy. We also have concentration of power, especially in the US and in China in telecommunications. Now, globalization certainly matters. Um, particularly because this information technology revolution has been, as two economists put it, turbocharged by globalization. You now have the ability to uh, communicate information across the globe. So if you are a banker, you can uh, carry out financial trades around the world in an instant. And that enables you to concentrate profits still more. Now, we have alliances of the powerful economic interests with policymakers in all three countries. You'll remember that in July of 2000, here in Russia, President Putin invited the most powerful oligarchs to meet with him and the Kremlin, and in effect offered an exchange with them. You stay out of politics, he said. You stay out of politics. Don't try to manipulate or influence political decisions. And in return, you may acquire wealth. Now, you remember there were oligarchs in Russia who challenged that bargain, such as Berezovsky, and Gusinsky, and later Khodorkovsky. But for the most part, the oligarchs have adhered to the deal that President Putin offered them. Now, I think we have similar arrangements, similar tacit understandings in the United States and in China. Um, under Xi Jinping, for example, there's an effort to uh, suppress some of the big what we would call oligarchs in the Russian context. In China, sometimes they use the word big crocodiles. Uh, and these are considered predators. So there have been selective crackdowns on the big crocodiles in China, but only selective. So it's similar to the crackdowns on people like Berezovsky and Khodorkovsky. It's selective. Other big crocodiles are doing very well. In the United States, we see the rise of very powerful economic interests who have contributed huge amounts of money to our political process. That would include the Koch brothers, whose interests are based in coal and, to some degree, oil. And more recently, a father and daughter, uh, the Mercer family, and they made their money in artificial intelligence and hedge funds. So we're looking at the energy sector, 
and the financial sector as the source of the wealth which has enabled the Koch brothers and the Mercer father and son to become extremely influential in our politics. Similar alliances, different forms in the three countries, goodness knows. Similar um, general oligarchic alliances, but with very different forms. So what are the results of these alliances? In the firms that are able to appropriate rents, we have very high average salaries, labor market income for the people working in them. Within those firms and in those branches, we have very high inequality of wages. Those at the top getting extremely high compensation and those in the middle and at the bottom getting much lower levels. <clears throat> We see an alliance with policymakers and other industries to keep labor costs down. <clears throat> so productivity goes up, but the gains of productivity are not being shared across the entire workforce. And of course, the rents that are collected from control over industry are shared with policymakers. Um, some of this is corruption and bribery, but not all of it. In the US, it can take the form of lobbying and campaign contributions. In Russia, it can take the form of projects, uh, uh, contributions, for example, to help construct the Sochi Olympic facilities or the World Cup facilities earlier this year. Uh, in China, frequently, the big corporations share their um, uh, revenues with policymakers in order to preserve the political machine of the Communist Party. But it limits redistributive spending. All three countries see pressure to keep down progressive income taxes. The US has seen a steady trend toward a less progressive income tax scale. And in Russia, we still do not have a progressive income tax, as I will say a word about more in a minute. And in China, the income tax uh, is in many ways purely on paper, purely pro forma. And it limits in all three countries spending on public goods, spending on public goods, whether that be health care or education or infrastructure. So what about Russia and the income tax? Um, can all of you read Russian? OK. So this was a question, again, during the Prima Linea in June. Somebody said to Putin, and he, and he answered this question, why don't we introduce uh, a progressive income tax and other tax reforms in order to increase the amount of revenue that government can use for public goods? Um, and the FL, the Nalok na Tahodov Fizitskih Lits, Irina Luks Pradaj, Toja Absurdalsia, we've discussed it. Experts have discussed it. But he says, you know what happened when we tried to introduce a progressive income tax scale before? And one of the moderates said, Skrivali, meaning that the people who were rich hid their incomes. They hid their incomes. And President Putin said, Sershana so it won't work. You know that practice of under the table wages, which is pretty widespread in Russia. Um, and the fiscal result, he says, there's simply, we don't get any benefit from raising the progressivity of the income tax. Now, that was an interesting point because it suggested that there would be political resistance. Who is President Putin worrying about? Where does the shum come from? Rich people. So I believe that the political alliance of those with powerful control over their industries with policymakers in all three countries help to explain the patterns that we observe of rising economic inequality. Specifically, concentration of incomes at the very top of the distribution, dualism in the labor market, that is, a sector of workers who are either informal or partly informal, uh, 
uh, which is a fairly large share of the labor force in all three countries. These being big and uh, differentiated countries, we see a great deal of inequality across regions in the three countries. And what I think is perhaps the most disturbing, we see the reproduction of inequality across generations. We see declining social mobility. Very worrisome. So let me show you um, the model in a very schematic way, and then I'll show you some uh, of the trends in inequality. So this is my scheme. Um, I think in all three countries we see this initial uh, phase of liberalization and deregulation. Initially it, it uh, stimulates competition and then rather quickly within those industries competition gives way to the concentration of some uh, firms within each industry. This then leads to alliances between the most powerful corporations in those industries and policymakers who share an interest in ac access to uh, rents. What are the goals of big business? Well, to keep labor costs down, to keep taxation down, to keep spending down on public goods. They also want to block competition to preserve monopoly power. And they want to increase the earnings for the managers at the top. What do the policymakers want? Well, in the US, with this very um, elaborate and expensive election system, uh, policymakers want access to campaign funds. Um, they want to acquire office by winning elections. Um, in other countries, uh, the policymakers want to use their alliance with big corporations uh, for strategic purposes. Um, in China, we have the Belt and Road Initiative, the One Belt, One Road Initiative, which is uh, a direction to keep the state-owned enterprises uh, building infrastructure outside China in order to advance China's uh, geopolitical interests. Um, and to create a favorable economic environment for China with respect to trade. And in all three countries, but I think most especially Russia and China, the policymakers want to preserve social stability by ensuring uh, employment um, and not upsetting the social contract. But here's the problem. In all three countries, there's resentment at the popular level against crony capitalism. In the United States, some of that resentment took the form, paradoxically, of the election of Donald Trump as president. Even though he is a billionaire or maybe a billionaire, we don't know, we haven't seen his tax returns. We don't know how much money he actually owes. But people think he's a billionaire and he pretends to be a billionaire. Nonetheless, he pretends to be a populist to speak for the little people. And he has successfully used that image to tap into anger on the part of many people who are badly affected by rising inequality. But he's an example of populist leaders that we have in many countries. Now, let's look at whether these industries are in fact concentrated. Uh, in Russia, Rostat publishes figures on industry concentration. If we look at the share of output of the top three enterprises, just three, we see then things like metal ores, almost half of all output is accounted for by just three enterprises. Um, crude oil, it's only about a quarter of output. In food products, of course, it's quite low, but that's not an industry where it's easy to capture rents. Natural gas, well, yes, over half of all output accounted for by the top three producers. Let's look at banks. In the United States, over 40% of all deposits and of all assets are held by the top five banks. And that concentration in the financial industry has grown over time. If we compare banking concentration across the BRICS countries, Russia and India and China, 
and Brazil, we see in Brazil and China extremely high concentration, but in Russia we also have very high concentration. Likewise, India, almost half of the market share is controlled by the top five banks. So very high concentration, and that gives you market power, which you can then convert into political influence through an exchange with policymakers. Now, what about the workplace? Well, in China, following liberalization, they dismantled what in China they used to call the iron rice bowl, that idea of guaranteed employment, uh, uh, guaranteed pension, uh, guaranteed housing. Uh, in the Soviet Union, there was a sim similar system where your social benefits depended on your employment in an enterprise. So in both countries, that's been to a large degree dismantled. Um, in the United States, uh, until recent decades, it was the case that many employees of companies got their retirement uh, income benefits, their pension benefits, from their company. Likewise, their health care benefits from their company. But that's less and less and less true in the U.S. And now in the U.S., people tend to be on their own. They have to buy their own health insurance if they can afford it. They have to um, buy additional pension insurance. We have a social security system, but most people cannot live on the pension that they get from the social security system. So people are more insecure, more insecure in all three countries. Um, I'll just show you this. This is access to employment-based employment -based retirement and health care benefits. DB means defined benefits. That means when you retire, you get a certain fixed pension every month. The number of people now who are getting defined benefits, fixed insurance, is down to 17%. DC is defined contributions. This is a little bit like um, what Russia tried to introduce with the system of uh, sistema where you would contribute from your earnings into, in effect, investment funds, pension funds. So you were subject to market risk. Now, as you know, Russia has frozen that uh, system of uh, contributing to the savings system since 2013. I'll skip over this. Now, when we look at inequality, I just want to make a point that often in the economics literature, they'll break down inequality and say, well, inequality is the result of this, this, and this. Frequently, those are simply accounting relationships. They are not causal relationships. And here we are at MGIMO thinking about what causes outcomes. And we are interested in both political and economic causes, not different ways of describing a phenomenon, but actually explaining why it occurs. So one of the things that we can do is to say, well, what measure of inequality are we using? And I would warn you against trusting the Gini indexes that are published about Russia or China or other countries, because usually those Gini index figures are based on surveys of households, and surveys of households in all countries will undercount the very richest people. So we are not getting an accurate picture of the earnings going to the top 1% or top 2%. Also, we need to distinguish between wealth and income, and I want to do that in a minute. Um, I'm going to skip over the spatial component of inequality. We can talk about it later. I'm going to skip over this. So I want to mention this problem of undercounting rich people. Um, maybe you know about the Russia Longitudinal Monitoring Survey, which is used uh, to track uh, households in Russia. 
Uh, the Wuxia School of Economics runs it now, and uh, they every year um, uh, survey households to find out how much they earn, what they get in benefits, what they spend on this, that, and the other thing. But the problem is they miss three, four, five percent, maybe more, of the richest households. So it doesn't give us an accurate representation of inequality. Moreover, especially in Russia and in China, you know there's an enormous amount of simply hidden income, hidden income, gray or black market activity that's not captured at all in any census. And that hidden income increases inequality. It doesn't tend to reduce inequality because most of it goes to people at the top. So the more an economy has hidden incomes, the higher its real inequality will be. So there are different ways we can try to measure real inequality. Thomas Piketty and his team at the uh, site World Wealth and Income Database, WID World, which you can readily access, have estimates for the actual distribution of wealth and income for many, many countries, including the US, Russia, China, and many others. We also have, for wealth, annual reports from a think tank in Switzerland, the Credit Suisse Global Wealth Report. For some things, we can use the household surveys that all these countries have. I'm going to skip over this. And I want to, for a moment, give you a global picture of inequality. Maybe you know the name of the economist Branko Milanovic. He used to work for the World Bank. Now he works for a university in New York. And he asked, over the last 20 years, how have the world gains in income been distributed? And he composed this famous graph called the elephant graph, which it's worth spending a moment looking at. This is the relative gain in real per capita income by global income level for this period from 88 to 2008. Now these are segments of the global income distribution. So down here are the poorest 10% of the world's population. Up here is the richest 10% of the world's population. And on this y-axis is total cumulative gain in income. What he shows is by far the largest gains globally have gone to the people in the top 1%. The people who have seen no net gains in income are the people here at about the 80th percentile globally. Let me ask you, what groups might that be? Thinking globally. Who might they be? Where might they live? What social segments might they represent? Exactly. The Western middle class, lower and middle class, including working class people in rich countries. So people in poor countries, and here above all we're talking about people in China and India who benefited from the changes in the global economy. And those at the very top benefited. And those who are, let's say, relatively well off in poor countries, they did very well. But the people who were at the middle in the rich countries lose out, relatively speaking, because they don't gain. So why is there resentment of elites? This helps explain. So let's look at some figures. This is now looking at wealth. And this is the most recent report, uh, just recently published from the Credit Suisse Global Wealth Report. The top 1% of wealth in Russia according to the Credit Suisse people, is on the order of 58%. In other words, well over half of all wealth in Russia is owned by 1% at the top. India, not quite as high. Africa speaking generally, high inequality, but not so high. We come down here, here's China. Europe has much lower inequality. United States, a little bit higher. 
and leading North America. Other measures. This is, again, the Globi, uh, Credit Suisse Global Wealth Report. Top 1% in Russia, about 57%. China may be a third of all wealth by the top 1%. In the US, a little bit over a third of all wealth. In Russia, it's gone up. It went way up, and then it has come down a little bit for the top decile, top 10%, about 82% of all wealth. This is wealth, not income, owned by the top decile. China, 61, 62%, an enormous share. In the US, even higher, over three-fourths of all wealth controlled by the top 10% of wealth owners. These are enormous inequalities in the distribution of wealth for these three countries. This is now income shares, income shares, and I'm using WID data. This is Piketty. Russia and the US surprisingly similar in the pre-tax income shares of the top 1%. Russia went way up, came down, and has leveled off. US just going up, 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 up. Canada and Germany, much, much less inequality. Top 1% share of national income. Bottom half, Russia, it's gone up, especially since the late uh, 2000s under President Putin, a little bit of a dip connected with the um, economic downturn in Russia in 2013, 2014, but up a little bit in the US, a rather steady decline in the share of income of the bottom half. Top decile, similar patterns to the top 1%. China a little bit behind Russia and the US in this concentration of income. Personal wealth of the top 1%. Now we're using Piketty's data for wealth, different um, measures. Very high concentration of wealth in the top 1% in Russia. The US a little bit behind, China a little bit farther behind. Top decile wealth shares, very similar patterns. Bottom half wealth. <clears throat> I wanted to call your attention to the fact that for many Americans, the average amount of wealth that they have is actually negative because their debts exceed their assets. They owe more than they own. But notice that this is declining in Russia and in China. This is the bottom uh, half of the income distribution. Down, down, down in the US. China down and then leveled off. Only 15% of the income is going to the bottom half of the population. So yeah, there's economic growth in China. But as a share of all growth, the bottom half of the population are not gaining. In Russia, we are seeing an increase at the bottom. This is a different measure of uh, the trend in China. This is from China's own yearbooks. Uh, in all provinces, the share of total income received by the bottom 20% is actually lower today. So yeah, it's an expanding economy, but most of the gains are not going to the people at the bottom. Now, let's look at this uh, picture by sector. The share of the financial industry and GDP is going up, 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 up. This is manufacturing, this green line. That share of total value added in the economy is actually declining. Trend in wages for different industries, information communications. Finance has gone up a great deal, much more than manufacturing and the other branches. Skip over this, skip over this. What about Russia? Financial sector has seen the highest growth in average wages, higher even than oil and gas. You might think that Rosneft and Gazprom and so on and so forth would see the highest average wages, but the financial industry has seen even greater gains in wages, much more than the average wage, much more than manufacturing or healthcare or education, and very little gain in wages in agriculture, not surprisingly. Similar pattern. Um, 
these are ratios. The average pay for members of the board of Rosneft in 2015, 312 million uh, rubles a year, not dollars, but rubles. Sberbank, 194 million rubles, not so bad, and so forth. Rosneft, pretty good. But the ratios of a CEO of a top 50 company to, let's say, a skilled worker in the Urals, he's getting a wage on average that is 800 times lower than the CEO of a top company in Russia. 800 times lower. Financialization in China. This is total net profits of all financial companies. And you see how it's risen. These are the wages in the industries in China, where <clears throat> the solid line is finance. Up, 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 up. Similar trend. Labor share. How much of the total national income goes to labor? In many countries, it's declining, likewise Russia. In the US, it's gone way down, since 2000 especially. In Russia and China, some decline in China. In Russia, it's actually gone up. Uh, we have seen an increase in wages in Russia. So the labor share has, in, in fact, increased, but not as much as the profits and wages at the top. I'm going to skip over this trend. These are regional differences, because I have already run out of time. And I'll come to my conclusions, and I would love to uh, answer questions and comments. So, similarities. Well, rising share of concentration of income and wealth at the top of the distribution in all three countries. Slower growth or even stagnation of incomes in the middle and at the bottom. In other words, in all three countries, the middle class is not rising as fast as the gains in income at the top. Some industries are benefiting more, and those are the industries positioned to capture rents, like finance, like oil and gas. And I believe this is partly true because of oligarchic alliances between the heads of the powerful concentrated industries, the corporations in those industries, with policymakers, where they exploit the ideology of growth, 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 protecting property rights, property, right, property rights, but what that means is protecting monopolies. Growing labor market dualism, that is a rising number of people who are receiving low wages or even wages off the book in the informal sector. It's rising in Russia, and it's rising in China, not declining, and it's rising in the United States. And, though I've skipped over this part, we are seeing a, um, a blockage of equalization across regions. So that's my presentation. Um, I'm sorry that I've gone on so long, but I would be very, very happy to answer any questions and comments. Please. Um, good, good morning, Mr. Robinson. We really appreciate you coming here and uh, very informative lecture. Um, I have a question that concerns probably everybody in Russia is the increase of um, prices for petrol, for diesel, and uh, we've witnessed a rapid increase of prices probably since May of this year, and um, uh, the, the government decided to reduce the fuel duty uh, until the end of this year, um, so at the beginning of the 2019 we will see an increase of the fuel duty by almost 30%. And um, now the prices are still sort of going up and the government a couple of days ago, I think they've decided to negotiate with the, uh, with the distributors of petrol and diesel uh, to freeze the prices until March 31st of the next year. So sort of on your, based on your knowledge and your, in your opinion, do you think that this, is, this negotiation with the petrol and diesel producing companies, is it going to, be, is it going to last like after the negotiation ends, like, is the prices going to stabilize in the long run, or do you think it's sort of a short-term measure that 
like in after March next year, we're going to experience a rapid increase of fuel again? Um, the question of uh, holding down prices for petrol, it's similar to the problem of holding down prices for food in other countries. In Russia, there is not now um, an effort to keep down the prices of food, but there is an effort to hold down the prices of gasoline. Um, these are always politically sensitive problems. Um, in a country uh, where fuel prices have been subsidized, which is the case in Russia, it is dangerous to let prices go up quickly and, ra and uh, uh, a large amount quickly because people react badly. Um, so in all likelihood, prices will resume slowly climbing in Russia, would be my guess, um, until they reach some kind of a competitive level. Um, an analogous problem for the United States is taxes on gasoline. Um, we have a federal tax on gasoline, which is used to help subsidize um, federal uh, highway construction. Our tax on gasoline is, most economists believe, too low. Uh, because the federal government has to spend an enormous amount to maintain federal highways. However, politically, it is impossible for policymakers to agree to raise the gasoline tax. And I think it's a similar problem in Russia. It would be desirable for both countries to increase federal taxes on gasoline in order to reduce consumption because emissions are a, an important source of climate change. But it's politically sensitive. So this question is really a political question. It's the government's calculation of the public's willingness to accept higher prices. And so beyond that, I don't know what will happen. Please. Uh, so, thank you for your lecture. And what do you think are the most effective policy measures to find inequality today? And if there are some, why are they effective? What learnings can we draw from fighting inequality? Um, <clears throat> I think in all three countries, there could be more efficient mechanisms for bargaining in society over the appropriate level of risk and reward for economic activity. Uh, I think in all three countries, uh, it would be important for the government to encourage more competition in the marketplace, but also to enforce regulations about labor. So government regulation would be one important mechanism and more effective bargaining over the appropriate levels of wages and uh, incomes. Um, in China, we don't have any party competition at all. Um, and we barely have any bargaining between labor and employers. In Russia, we have, uh, in effect, no bargaining between employers and labor over wages and prices. The bargaining that exists under the auspices of the three-sided commission, the Trioch Staronia Commissia, for social and economic uh, problems is purely pro forma. If there were an opportunity for labor to bargain with employers to say, let us share in the benefits of economic growth so that all of labor will pay into, let's say, social insurance funds, and all of labor will pay into taxes that, public, that uh, support public goods, and in turn, businesses are willing to pay their taxes, then you have something like a social contract, a social consensus. We don't have that in the US. We don't have it in Russia. We don't have it in China. We need better institutional mechanisms, in my opinion, for reaching these agreements. I think we need better information about the actual state of inequality. United States and Russia are two of the only countries in the world where, in public opinion surveys, that ask people, what do you think is the actual level of inequality in your country? Russia and the United States, people grossly underestimate how much inequality there is. They don't know, because so much of the um, benefits of high income at the top and high wealth 
are hidden. They're hidden. And the same is true in China. In France and in Germany and many other countries, in the same surveys, when they ask people, what do you think is the actual level of inequality? They grossly exaggerate it. So if we had better media about, better media publicity, better media coverage, more accurate understanding of how high is inequality, where is the income going, in all of these countries, there might be more public pressure to achieve a more equitable balance of opportunity. There's a very famous Chinese economist named Wu Jinglian, and he's considered the father of market reforms. And he is very worried about inequality. And he says the reason for high inequality in China is because of high inequality of opportunity high inequality of opportunity. Why is there high inequality of opportunity? He says, above all, corruption and monopoly. So he says we need to have more competition, more transparency, less monopoly, less corruption, so that more people can enter the marketplace. That will equalize incomes. More market is his answer. Not more central planning, more market. And I think he's right. But I think you do have to have regulation of a market. I think market economic structures have to be embedded in a system of regulation. They say in France, we want to have a market economy. We don't want to have a market society. And I think that's a very apt way of putting it. I think we should, in all of these countries, use the market mechanism to equalize opportunities, but to regulate that market so that it doesn't exaggerate the difference between winners and losers. Thank you uh, for your talk, Dr. Remington. <clears throat> I wanted to ask, by the measures you showed, Russia seems to have the largest inequality among the three countries, yet it's the only country among the three whose bottom half also has growing wages. And you didn't really touch on what you think the explanation for that might be. Uh, right. Right. Um, <clears throat> um, we have very high inequality of incomes in Russia, but the inequality of wealth in Russia is by far the highest in the world. Uh, it's in a class of its own. Now, wealth doesn't automatically convert into income. A lot of wealth is non-income producing. <coughs> It's not productive. Think of um, oh, an oligarch like Rybolyovlev. Um, he bought that extraordinarily valuable Leonardo da Vinci painting um, a few years ago, which he just recently sold to the government of Abu Dhabi. It's worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Well, that painting is not generating any income regardless of who owns it. Think of the Russian oligarchs that own real estate in Russia, on the Riviera, in London, in Dubai. They have a high concentration of wealth, but not all of it is capital. What's happening in Russia is those private wealth holders have a huge concentration of wealth, but the government in Russia is increasingly responsible for the distribution of income. So what the statistics are showing, Rostat statistics, is that the share of total national income in Russia from entrepreneurship is about half of what it was 20 years ago. The share of income from wages is about the same. The share of income from property is declining. The government is providing more and more in social transfers and in wages. So more and more people in Russia depend upon the state for their wages. The state can help equalize wages, although incomes for people in uh, these state-owned enterprises and private enterprises, those incomes at the top can go up. But people's incomes who are lower and middle levels can rise also, partly due to government equalization. That's not market forces. That's the fact that the economy in Russia is becoming more uh, state-controlled. So. <clears throat>
Please. Can I ask one more question? Sure. Uh, I'm curious, in the, in the data you showed, it seemed like uh, for each of the three countries you chose, there might be other countries which have more similar patterns of inequalities. For Russia, that looked like Africa and India. And so beyond the simple measures of inequality, what, what are the other reasons you chose specifically these three countries to compare? Um, I want to, I can, I can uh, show you why I'm choosing those three. These are slightly different figures. In all three cases, the countries that I've looked at stand out among comparative country, comparable, comparable countries. The US has higher inequality than any of the other advanced industrial democracies. Now Portugal is still a rather poor country with high inequality, but higher than any of the other advanced industrial, higher than anything else in the OECD. Among the former Soviet and East European countries, Russia's inequality is the highest. In East Asia, China is the highest. So among their peers, yeah, they stand out. That's why I'm choosing them. Any disagreements with my argument about oligarchic alliances? Where am I wrong? I really would like to know because um, I'm still thinking a lot about it. Yeah. So I may have one direct question. So what would be your answer to the question that has been asked to Putin during the direct line? Oligarchia nasida? That question? Will it end uh, one day? So I think it was a question that was uh, Or about the income tax. No, the oligarchia nasida? Yes. Yeah. No, I don't think there has, to, there has to be oligarchy forever, if only because oligarchy is unstable. I believe that over the long run, our oligarchy is not sustainable. I think in Russia, there's uh, evidence that over the centuries, um, uh, people, the masses, don't like the concentration of wealth and power. And uh, I frankly think it's a dangerous combination. Very, very high wealth with people who have the power that goes with it. Now, in Russia, uh, the public opinions polls show people are resentful of the oligarchs, but they don't associate the oligarchs with vlast. The oligarchs are one thing, uh, President Putin is another. But if at some point President Putin is regarded as being uh, allied with people who are extremely wealthy, that um, will reduce the popularity of the people in power. And it will demand, it will call for demands, it will lead to demands for greater social justice. Um, President Putin actually on several occasions has spoken about inequality as being far too high in Russia. And he wants, you know, in principle, he wants to do something about it. The problem is he's, his main base of support really is powerful people and he is unwilling to take those steps that would reduce their power to concentrate market power. So how serious, um, how serious is the effort to increase social justice? We'll see, but I, I actually think there will be political pressure uh, on the authorities in Russia um, to do more to improve opportunity for people. Uh, periodically in President Putin's speeches, we see very uh, progressive ideas like um, uh, in his Paslanya, his message to Parliament earlier this year, he had remarkable and interesting ideas about improving cities. Well, no Russian ruler previously has said cities are an important engine of economic development. We have to give cities the opportunity to develop. We have to link cities with communications, both transportation and communications, and they should be our engines of growth. I, I hope he does something about that because I think that would help equalize Russia both across regions and between rich and poor. So I think these ideas are, are not new for the people in power, but it's very difficult for them to overcome the resistance of those who benefit from the current system. Uh, yes, ma'am. 
Um, Professor Remington, thank you very much for your lecture. And uh, I have one question. Is there any competition uh, between other members of oligarchic um, alliances, between uh, those people who monopolize, uh, well, their influence in different spheres of economy in terms of their influence on politics? Uh, at present, no. There, there's not a competition. Um, uh, if there were to be uh, a clear uh, point of succession, if uh, in 2024 uh, President Putin were to decide not to run for re-election, uh, there might be open competition among different oligarchic alliances. That's a possibility. At present, I don't see that kind of competition. Uh, I think each uh, uh, important uh, block of economic power uh, has a place in the system, uh, and they unite around certain shared interests in preserving the stability of the system that benefits them. So, uh, yes? Just to touch upon what you said about the development of the cities in the region yes. as well. I think they also need to um, restructure the way they collect and send taxes because, for yeah. example, um, a city in the region, there's like a capital of the region and there are the small cities. Yeah. So the small cities, they collect taxes and 50% goes to the federal budget to Moscow, 25 goes to the regional budget and only 25% of the budget that the city collects, like the taxes, is left. So that's probably the main issue because there's not basically there's only enough money to sort of so sort of to sustain the city to keep it going, but there's no money for development whatsoever. The only like the the big projects that regions get come from Moscow. Well, I agree with you. And by the way, that problem is not uh, unique to Russia. We have echoes of the same problem in the U.S. What an economist would say, and I would very strongly agree, is cities, cities should have greater um, autonomy to retain revenues that they collect from encouraging economic development. Right now, cities in Russia have very little autonomy to uh, keep the revenues and to invest them into, let's say, infrastructure or education. Um, Russia, not just since the Soviet period, but during the Soviet period, concentrated a lot of power at the level of the oblast, or the krai, rather than at the level of the city. And that introduces a certain bias towards small towns and rural interests in the political calculation. Now, an example from the United States that's somewhat similar. Our US Senate has two senators from every state as you know. Two from giant California, two from tiny Rhode Island, two from Wyoming, two from Maine. What does that mean? That means rural areas are overrepresented in our political system. So surprisingly enough, there's a similar bias in our political system. Likewise, our constitution mentions states. They are the you say the subjekti federatsi in Russia. You say they are the constituent elements of the federation. In the U.S., it's states. States have rights. In the U.S., the cities get their rights from the states. So states are never very interested in giving cities greater autonomy. I believe that cities have greater um, ability to stimulate economic development but frequently they are um, deprived of the right to do that. And that's very strongly the case in Russia. I think you're exactly right. Please. You spoke about um, the resentment towards the oligarchs in Russia and how that's kind of separated out from how Russians view political officials. Do you see the same situation in the United States? Because I think in the United States, a lot of times it's it's resentment against political officials regardless of the wealth they might personally have or be receiving from the Koch brothers or other wealthy donors. It sounds to me like you're from the United States. Is that the case? From where? Um, I'm from Philadelphia, but I go to school in Virginia. Um, you may remember then uh, when the Tea Party movement arose in the United States. It's faded quite a bit. But that anger was very powerful, and it succeeded. It was a kind of a populist 
right-wing populist movement that elected many congressmen, very often very right-wing congressmen. And part of the movement of the Tea Party talked about crony capitalism, this unhealthy alliance of big business and Washington. Now, mostly what those politicians are doing is deflecting the blame, defecting, deflecting the resentment, the anger against Washington, not against the crony capitalists. So, so far, it's, um, I think, far more, as you say, voters associate Washington with their problems. My taxes are too high. That's Washington's fault. Uh, or they'll blame China. China has taken away my job. The, the authorities have allowed globalization to destroy my factory, and I no longer have a job. So it's somebody else. But there is much less blame associated with um, uh, the wealthy and powerful. And why is that? Because Americans historically have been comfortable with higher levels of inequality than have Europeans. And we are fearful that if we restrict the rights of business people at the top, it will restrict the rights of business people in the middle. And that's a very persistent theme in American politics. It, it, it may change. And the United States just a week ago saw an election where um, Democrats won many races. Um, and that's a sign that the political wind, the political direction in the country is beginning to change. So. Well, maybe we are out of time. If so, let me thank you. It's been a real pleasure to meet with you. And keep in touch.